KTLO. That's what the thing is. It's KTLO. It's Friday. It's episode 45. Now, that's a very interesting number because that means we're approaching a year of this insanity, whatever this thing is. It's not a what? It's not a webcast. It's not a uh, discussion. Well, no, wait, it is a discussion. It's not a training thing. It's we're just meeting here. We're talking about things that are important to us and maybe to you too. It's a and conversation. It is a conversation. And so we're going to bend your ear for the next out. Oh, oh, reference to the episode title. Look at that. Oh my goodness. Keeping the learning on bend an ear, bend a mind. How does that work? Pray tell. Unbelievable. Doesn't that and depend on which decade you lived in? I, I believe it. It does depend on which decade you lived in. <laughs> what decade? What's a decade? Um, anyhow, here we are. The core four are here. Patty Blackstaff, Greg Sanker, Simone Joe Moore, and moi. And we are here. What day is it today, Simone? Tell us what day it is today. What you today say? is Chinese New Year. Xin Yan Guai Le. Happy New Year to all our Chinese speaking listeners. And it's the year of the ox. So I think it's about, you know, we're going to be sturdily plowing our way through, creating those furrows to germinate all that wondrous nourishment we need. Year of the ox. I finally got a year. Oh, good. Um, so uh, if you want to get a hold of any of us, here's our Twitter stuff. And uh, we're all on YouTube. You can find us and maybe you already know who we are, um, whatever. We do have guests with us today. We'll introduce them shortly. Uh, but hey, today's interviewer is Simone Joe Moore. And so take it away, Simone. Coucou-la. Bon après-midi, mes amis. How are you all? We're a very multicultural group and uh, we enjoy talking about all sorts of things including how we might shift mindsets and sometimes we just prattle on and bend people's ears right nah okay so let's have a think of it this way in the human communication process the brain processes sound before it processes language now quick example if you hear a song on the radio you don't like, normally your natural instinct is you're either going to turn it off or change the channel. Sometimes we put up with it if we know it's only going to last a short time, but that becomes an excruciating memory. And if that's the case, what this really means is if we don't like what we hear, that could be from your boss, it could be what you're reading, it could be a particular voice that you hear in the background or even the person that's talking to you, but it means our crocodile brain shuts it down and it doesn't even try to process the words or the meaning. So if we're going to bend minds to see new perspectives and ways of thinking, what do we have to do to shift from sounds to listening with meaning and intent? So mm. what? Why is bend an ear really appropriate here? I mean, you know, it's really just about annoying people, isn't it? Well, speaking of annoying people, we have guests in the waiting room. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered how you were going well, to do that. Oh, you meant annoying people yeah. as opposed to annoying people. Ah, okay. Well, yeah, these people are not annoying. We have, let's see, Daniel Breston and we have Dee Burgoyne and we have N.J. Robinson, and we have Kathy Veldboom, just letting these people in, just open the doors up. So anyway. The question was, just so our guests people. hear it. Yeah, exactly. You know, So to our wonderful guests that we'll have interludes with later, I just asked Roy, why is bending in here an appropriate thing to talk about? Because surely it's just about annoying people. Roy. <laughs> and, I, and I said, annoying people. Um, <laughs> well, there's some definitions of bending an ear 
that include trains, uh, but most of them don't. And in any event, bending an ear can mean you're just talking on incessantly and I'm bending your ear about this, even though you don't want to hear about it anymore. That's, that's one of the ways to look at it. But I prefer to think of it as, as uh, making sure that the person who maybe doesn't want to listen to you actually is getting a message. And, and sometimes it's very casual. You can say, hey, let me bend your ear about this idea for a minute. Let me, let me share this idea with you. So it can, it can be very casual. But I think in, in the sense that we're going to talk about it today, it means let me make sure that I've got your attention. Uh, you know, bending an ear comes from this gesture when you, am I hearing you properly? And that's, it's all about listening. It's about listening more than speaking. So I think that's the angle we're going to approach it from today. Oh, that's an interesting one because when you think, you know, I want to make sure you're listening, it just reminds me of, and this is in days long gone, uh, when I remember my father actually twisting my ear, you know, <laughs> literally <laughs> to say, did you hear what I just said? And, you know, I, I think that was something you know, like a Pavlov's dog thing, you know, where it was like combining the words with making sure I'm listening. So, <laughs> if bending an ear is supposed to be leading to bending a mind, we must be talking about something a little bit deeper than yeah. a prolonged dialogue, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I, here's the way I think about it. I think bending an ear is, is changing. Cause you talked about, you know, we, we tune out things that we, we, we either are overly familiar with blah, blah, heard it, blah, blah. I'm not really registering or thinking too, very deep about it. Or something that I don't like. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing information that I don't like, that bothers me, that I have a strong anti-belief to that thing, and we tune it out. And so to me, bending an ear is to enabling them to hear things in a different light, it, even if just slightly differently than the uh, predisposition. And I'm hoping we, we dig in a little bit more uh, about perspectives and, and, and active listening and, and to understand others' perspectives, starting with our, ourselves. But, but that's, to me, the bending an ear is about changing the way we're hearing what we're hearing and, and ourselves and others. Well, it really is. And, and I think that was the one thing whenever I've been teaching the human communication process is how do we get, you know, past that point of where we're shutting down because we just don't like the sound of something. So... Patty, what is it about tuning in instead of tuning out that helps us understand others better? You know, I belong to a uh, the World Business and Executive Coaching Group, and and uh, in our summit was a lady who did a session this week, and it was just so timely. She did a session, her name is Tatiana Bakirova, who's a professor of coaching and psychology at Oxford Brookes University. And she said that uh, there is something we fail to pay attention to, and that is multiplicity. And that is the many selves we have inside of us. So, and I'm not talking about multiple personality disorder here, but I am talking about who we show up as. I know in an earlier episode, I mentioned uh, quite some time ago, I mentioned you know, we're a different person when we're standing up and speaking to people than we are when we go home to our families, right? And who we show up as is um, really uh, involving how the snapshot in time of who we are in that moment has been impacted by the environment and what's going on, what might be going on at home. And so when we talk about tuning in, sometimes it's um, not so much about listening to the words said, but paying attention to the other person and how they're showing up for you. Because if you can pay attention to the other person and how they show up for you, the chameleon color they are at the time may in fact be what they need you to see or observe about them. And so tuning in helps us understand others better if we have more situational awareness, some empathy and compassion for how they may be walking into the room because we are all chameleons and I love that example that she described about you know being a chameleon because we do that we walk into the office and we are the our office person and we walk into our home and we are our home person and we're very much a chameleon that that allows us to 
um, bring and shine all the different parts of our personality. But some days we bring one into another. And having a leader or someone who you're working with that can understand the person that you've walked in as um, can tune in and help that person better understand uh, how you they can meet your expectations. I think I rambled there, but no, not at all. I don't think so at all. And and of course, as happens, you always touch on a favorite subject of mine, which is around that whole emotional agility, not just the intelligence of it, but how we, man, you know, really uh, do maneuver um, our relationship in that moment in time with the person that we're with. Um, it, it is so true. I mean, you know, Patty, you and I, yeah, we got the memo. We're in our red shirts and, you know, hey, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, Roy, when you think about that, what's an example you have from your own career when that kind of listening or just, you know, that, that deeper listening really made a big difference? You need to come off mute, Roy. Why do I have to come off mute? I always have to come off Because I love listening to your dulcet Why? tones. Why? Uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry about that. Uh, there was a particular project I'm thinking of when uh, we had some consultants in and we were working with a particular department in the organization. And these, these two sides were not really getting through to each other. Uh, the folks in the department were set on, this is how we've always done it. This is the way we do it. We don't know any other way. This is our way. And the consultants were saying, okay, well, let's back up a little bit here and let's think about what you're actually trying to accomplish. And maybe there's a simpler, more straightforward way that takes fewer steps and we can help facilitate that. Well, this is the way we've always done it. <laughs> and so it was bending an ear because it was the same statement over and over again, where people just were not getting it because they weren't really listening. And that's, that's the key. So Finally, what we did, and I was working closely with the consultants at that point, and, and we finally just started asking questions that were very precise, simple, and didn't directly impinge on the person's view that this is the way we've always done it. And that's the key. You have to kind of come at it sideways. And, and there's a great book on this subject, by the way. It's called Just Listen uh, by Mark Goulston. And uh, it's a wonderful book. And it talks about the technique of getting people to actually open up, working with somebody difficult who's not listening to you, not paying attention. You kind of come at it sideways. So you're not confronting them in a way that makes them defensive, but makes them open up a little bit. And now they can start to pay attention without feeling threatened. Yeah, I, I always like that kind of thing, you know, being uh, if you're into astrological signs, it's, it's the year of the ox, but I happen to be a Cancerian and I do tend to actually do the scuttle thing sideways and a little advance and stuff like that. But, you know, occasionally there's still some sharp pincers that might be coming at you <laughs> when we're having these conversations. And uh, speaking of um, coming at things sideways, Greg, um, <laughs> I might have deserved that. I might have deserved that. Um, Patty mentioned, especially about showing up in that moment, you know, and uh, paying attention to, you know, who we are in the moment. So right. how do you actually go about bending your own ear? I'm sorry. I wasn't really listening when Patty was talking, so I don't really <laughs> know what she said. I, gosh. I no, let's get changed. you a Matrix plug-in. Yeah. Nothing's changed, Greg. Nothing's yeah, changed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here's the thing. Uh, you know, as, as I was thinking about this whole bending one's ear and the idea of getting people to listen, there was a subtle implication that I'm always right. I'm the one that always is tuned in. And my job or my desire is to get other people to expand their thinking so that I can help them see the world the way I do. And that's not, it's not it at all. It starts with me. And so it, it's it's asking yourself a lot of questions and, and, and not closed questions like, do I agree with this? Yes. Um, ask open questions like, why do I think this? Why do I believe that? What has caused me to, can I support that? Are there people who don't agree with me? And you want to put yourself in the mindset 
of people who think differently than you. And I know for many people, if, if politics, anyone, put yourself in the middle of people who think very, very differently and keep asking yourself to better understand their perspective. And you want to listen to understand. Everybody knows that. But we all do this. We don't listen to understand. We listen to find out, oh, yeah, you believe that. And you're wrong because of this. And that is not bending your ear. That's not opening your mind. And, and there's a lot of people who think that if I, if I open myself to challenge my beliefs, my thoughts, my, my views of what you know, is right and wrong and good and bad and all those things that I'm, that I'm selling out and I'm, and I'm giving up on my core values. And it's just the opposite. Because opening your mind to the possibility that you could be flawed or incomplete or, or wrong opens you up to the possibility that, no, I really do believe this. And here's exactly why. Your ideas have been tried. Your ideas have been challenged and, and you come out. But if you don't challenge them, if you just sit in your little bubble and say, no, I'm right and don't challenge me, and you're fearful that your house of cards will collapse, then you're not opening your mind at all. So it starts with you. It starts with me, um, first and foremost, bending an ear. And when I've shown that, that, that uh, willingness to listen openly and ask probing questions about their belief without coming back and saying, see, this is why you're wrong. That's when we can start having a mind altering conversation that, for the, for the better. I'm going to challenge you on a couple of things there. Oh just boy. Because I, yeah, I know. <laughs> what do you expect? <laughs> um, but, you said something really interesting, you know, this is my world, and I'm trying to help you understand my position and, and you know, listening to, are we listening to uh, give our opinion or are we listening to understand? And part of that human communication process I mentioned at the beginning. So if we, I mean, the whole reason we communicate is to, uh, we want the other person to either understand and or do something. That's the sender, right? Whatever the, you know, whoever's transmitting their message. And on the other side, we've got the receiver. So the, the biggest lesson in that bending our own ear is as the receiver of whatever's coming at us is what is this person trying to, wanting me to understand and or do? But one of the things that can come across there is, isn't bending, you know, if I'm wanting to shift their perspective and shift their mind, isn't that, similar to what happens in brainwashing and mind control? Oh boy, you stepped in it, didn't you? I, oh, big time. <laughs> you know, what people who might be tuning in the broadcast don't know is Simone and I pick on each other incessantly, but we generally agree that on the air, we're not gonna do that. Thanks a lot for violating the code. Here's the thing, you, 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 really, you really could look at it as that, right? Because if, if, if I'm gonna have a chat with, with Patty, and the purpose of the chat is to, it's like, Patty, look, I really don't care what you think. What I need you to do is think the way I think. Now, raise your hands if you've ever worked for a manager, a boss, or an organization that really felt like, raise your hands, if they felt like that was their job, is to get you in line with the party message. That is mind control or brainwashing or trying to change somebody else's perspective with, in, a, in a very disrespectful way. So, uh, so I, I feel like bending somebody's mind is, is trying to expand it. And, and I find it particularly helpful when there's people that like have knowledge from other fields, like, hey, you used to be a carpenter before you became a, a database analyst. Uh, I've seen it. Uh, what concepts from that perspective would happen? You know, measure twice, uh, cut once. Hey, that's a good idea. Uh, the idea that, you know, you have to analyze the, the grain of the wood. That's a different way of looking at things. Database architects don't generally do that sort of stuff. Um, one of the most challenging problems that I faced when I was uh, doing a problem management was solved by somebody who had a background in theology and, and not information technology is because he had a different view of the world, right? So it starts with expanding that your thinking and, 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 our, and, and I'll cite Patty for this. When you, Patty has, has uh, contributed the, are my truths still true? Are my truths true now or are they still true? Is, is something changed? And so, and that's, she could do a dissertation on that and I would encourage her to do so. But the idea that we believe things so deeply that we believe that they're true, objectively true, that everybody should agree with this. It's true in any culture, any time, any land. And it's not necessarily true. And when we allow ourselves to ask that, 
then, then that's where we can start actually expanding and growing. So if your goal is really to just change somebody else's mind, even if it's a, a competitive debate sort of thing, then that is mind control of, of sorts. Just like, you know, I have to dismantle your argument so that you come along to my way. But if you really are trying to bend somebody's ear, you're trying to expand your perspective and their perspective as well. Um, and, and I have seen a lot of command and control style of managers uh, that, that really are trying to control your mind. It's like, could you just stop questioning things and just go with the program? I was like, well, maybe they're not going with the program because they don't yet understand the program. Maybe they have some, some, some perspectives on this thing that we're all jumping on board to that we need to hear and understand. Yeah, there's certainly a balance to be struck, I think. You know, as a manager, sometimes it's like I, I'm quite happy for people to challenge and to ask the questions and to to uh, ask them, well, why are we going about it this way? Can't, why can't you change your mind and do it this, you know, a different way and so on and so forth? I think there's a difference between um, the what needs to get done you know, in a time frame, in a focus on an outcome that needs to happen versus being narrow-minded as well. But that's an interesting facet. So from that perspective, Patty, I mean, we've talked about before what kind of sweet sauce is needed for companies so they can be open-minded and thrive. I mean, does this, what's the relevance to today's conversation in regard to that? So I'm going to bring a few things. I've written words down that that everybody has said. And I'm going to bring a few things forward and then answer your question. Diversity of thought. Be with people who think differently. Ask a lot of questions. How does the receiver receive? Expand and contract and go with the program. So those things I, I, I kind of wrote down because go with the program is the we are this, it always looks like this, and we're never going to innovate. And think about that, right? We're never going to innovate. If you want a company to thrive, you need to have breakthroughs in the development and the work that you do in order to continue growing. If it's go with the program, you're not moving. And that command and control is exactly the word you used, Greg, with um, where you said uh, it it muffles you, it contracts you. And that feeling you get as a human being when you're being controlled is very contracting. But growth in an organization is about expansion. It's about expanding possibility, right? So uh, I was watching um, a presentation by Aaron Walton. He's the CEO of Walton Isaacson this week. And he's, he is, he, I, Walton Isaacson, just for frame of references, is a design place that does ads for very, very big companies. And, and uh, they're incredible. They're in New York City. He said, cultural breakthroughs are like this. Action is informed by culture. And it's the best line. It says a whole bunch right in that. And if we're going to bend an ear or bend a mind, we have to have exactly what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with psychological safety. We need an organization where we're able and capable and safe to do so. Because what's going to make a difference is chaos, collision, challenge, getting uncomfortable, having diverse backgrounds, thoughts, knowledge, cultures, history, all in the same room, showing each other all kinds of ways of looking at things, shifting perspective, hearing other people's thoughts. So that being said, I want to give you a couple stats that are really interesting. These are from Fast Company. The higher representation of women in the C-suite level positions results in 34% greater returns to shareholders. Think about that. Okay, so that's just one piece of the of the diversity um, um, pie, right? Because our backgrounds and culture and experiences are so rich and, and worthwhile. And then organizations with an above average gender diversity and levels of employment engagement outperform, outperform companies with below average diversity and engagement by 58%. So there's real data 
and real science behind the importance of diversity of thought and the ability and safety to have chaos collision and challenge and bending an ear i think of i when i think of bend an ear i think of like a satellite dish right what am i really listening for how am i bending my own ear in order to absorb the information i need without judgment so patty i'm i'm going to go back and review the episode so i can write every single word that you just said because i'm going to publicly call out that that was spectacular your, your, your data that you brought to the table demonstrate in an irrefutable way. And when you sit at the, the senior executive table, you've got to be able to prove it with data. You can't just say, we should let people challenge things more. It's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Command and control is afraid of chaos, collision, and challenge. Command Absolutely. and control, fear-based cultures do not. That would be the last thing that they would want to have. But successful organizations, particularly where there's innovation and rapid motion uh, forward, you know, digital transformation, or let's just say survival so that we can stay in the game long enough to be, be relevant tomorrow and the day after requires everybody in the game. And so the kind of safety that Patty has been talking about is a core requirement. And yet so many leadership teams are fighting that tooth and nail at the very instinct. And I'm going to yield the rest of my time because Patty, that was spectacular. The best thing that's ever been said on KTLO. Oh, I might challenge the best, but pretty bloody close. <laughs> no, actually the one thing that's so cool about this um, is that it's something that you said earlier, Greg, that I think is really important is that if we're going to bend people's ears, it needs to be in, you know, in a worthwhile way. It needs to be in a language that they need to hear it. And statistics, I think the, the truth versus fact is one of those conversations we've had in other episodes that we could have a whole other episode on in regards to that because of how powerful those things are. And Patty, you are definitely one of our brilliant uh, statisticians, because you you take you take that fact and turn that into a purpose, and uh, that that's something that uh, is so wonderful to have uh, for the people out there that are wanting to know how do we talk to our leaders about this stuff. If we're going to bend their ear, how are we going to go about doing that? And one of the ways to do that is to make sure that you've got the facts that are integrated and given in that sense of purpose as opposed to just a number in front of their face. Um, and speaking of putting, uh, you know, bending people's ears, I'm going to shift this into our guest interlude and someone we haven't seen for a while. NJ, welcome. It's been mm. a while, matey. Um, yeah. But um, so how's this ear bending experience been for you? Has it, has it uh, bended your mind as well? Oh my goodness, yeah. So Patty, Greg, just such rich uh, perspectives and input. And so this is really like therapy for me. So I'm going, as anytime I transition to new positions, I'm in a new position now, I do a lot of introspection and uh, reflection and such on things I could have did better where I left. And when I just left, I went through some similar words. So I'm a A-type, uh, ENTJ, DI on a disc, type of aggressive leader. Uh, and, but I, I wanna be, I always say to my team, hey, challenge me, let's be collaborative. I, so I understand and respect the need for different thoughts. However, I find, I seek out weaknesses in these different thoughts to confirm why I'm so quote unquote great. And so, um, and so yeah, so is that it's that I want, like I desperately want it uh, maybe, um, intellectually but it's something inside of me that wants to push back against it uh, when I hear it and so very specifically I had a um, one of my direct reports over all my day-to-day -day operations he was he was completely different from me um, he was very relational and um, just very much wasn't as aggressive as I was and his perspectives and everything was completely to me backwards and so there I am wanting someone around me who's different, who can challenge my own biases and my own thoughts. And when I actually had that, 
I uh, rejected it because it didn't look and feel like me. And so now where I'm at now, yo, I'm in a different role. Uh, it's a different situation. So I'm, so I'm trying to look back now. It's like, where did I go wrong? What is it about me that wants to reject that, even though I know it's good? Um, and so this is very good. And so that's a challenge I have for myself is just, uh, uh, you know, how to just accept what I know is right and, um, and move forward as a leader. Because as a leader, I understand the importance of diversity. I, I champion diversity. I champion collaboration and different trains of thought. But when it comes to me, I need to be able to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk when it comes to my specific domain or area of responsibility. Yeah, NJ, I just really want to say thank you so much for sharing that because that's uh, brilliant. I mean, the best leaders actually, uh, you know, showcase themselves and are transparent about, about the way they think and the feel and the way they move ahead. And I think that's just superb. And and Patty, I know that this is an area you coach in for the executives, etc. cetera. So uh, I'd love if you could respond to what NJ has been talking about. You know, NJ, something this week, I, I keep mentioning WBEX, this uh, full summit that I'm a part of, uh, but I mention it because we are a, are a worldwide global group of coaches. And one of the exercises that Tatiana Bakarova shared with us on Multiplicity this uh, week was really, really good. She said, when you are judging someone else's differentness, and you are saying to yourself, I am not, write whatever that not is. I am not um, uh, whatever, you know, you're describing that judgment as or that person as in that judgment. And then write that word down again, but say I am and put that same word there and then follow it by in these circumstances. And all of a sudden you narrow the gap because I, and so I was doing the exercise with her and uh, the word I picked was cruel because I was thinking of someone <laughs> and, and then I wrote, I am cruel and I am in these circumstances when this happens, how that happens. And when we turn something around like that on ourselves and we actually describe a situation where we can equally be judged as that, that same thing, then we open the door to closing the gap in the relationship with that person. Yeah. So I don't know if that's helpful, but. I, I think it is absolutely indeed. And, you know, there, there are parts of ourselves that we have to recognize you know, none of us are perfect and never will be. Um, as we've often said, it's our journey of becoming who we want to be. Um, it's about who we want to uh, aspire to. And I think the best person we can ever aspire to is just to be the best of ourselves. And somebody I know that uh, knows that better than anyone is D, because you have introduced into leadership a very important topic around compassion. And I think that has a lot to do with how we bend ears and bend minds. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And um, I have all kinds of little notes written here in front of me, but I want to play off of something that NJ talked about, which is diversity and inclusion. That's something that I, being born with a disability, am very committed to and always have been. And I, I watch what's going on in, in uh, the world. And I think diversity, you know, diversity to me is a, is a noun. And inclusion is a verb. Inclusion is active. And inclusion means including everybody. And the very first step to doing that is understanding people, like, like Patty was talking about. I, uh, be, being a leader, I think that there's a couple of words that come to mind that people can succeed if they concentrate on these. One of them is authenticity, which someone mentioned how uh, you're one person at work and one person at home. And it reminded me that years ago, I had some people working for me. And <laughs> I mean, I'm a little rock and roller. I am, I, I am really into uh, all kinds of music and I have this certain persona at home. And at home, I was called uh, D. And at work, I've always, always, always been called Denise. 
And it, it hit me like a ton of bricks one day when I was traveling with someone in Wichita, Kansas. We were opening a new call center. And <laughs> I turned the radio on and started singing. And this person that had worked with me for four years, and I, I kid you not, said to me, I didn't know you listened to music. I, <laughs> I mean, who doesn't listen to music? I just was like, whack, who, you know, how am I not bringing any part of myself to work? So I, I really started concentrating on that. And then I had a situation where my work life and my personal life collided in a hospital. And I had to pick which one I was going to be. And I picked D because I thought D represented me better. And I learned to let loose and be a little more uh, genuine I choose a word every year for growth and development. And I was, I received this message and it's so important to me that my word for the year, and I think many leaders could listen to this is vulnerability. I think uh, going back to what NJ was saying that people, leaders think they can't be or appear vulnerable at all, or like they don't know what's going on at all. Because, and the reason that we're afraid to do that is because it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. We it is uncomfortable for yeah. us to have a persona assumption, like that, yeah. that someone might see a crack in the persona, right? No, we are. Yeah, and it's, it's uh, I call it unfamiliar territory. Anytime a leader does not want to go into unfamiliar territory, which happens when you're vulnerable, they're, they're shutting down communication. And communication is a process. It is not an event. Many people put out a memo. I've seen leaders put out a memo, put out a, an email or whatever, and they think that's communication. Back to where we started with Roy. It's not a one-way one arrow goes this way. Communication. Oh, I did it. I did it. Didn't you, didn't you hear me tell you that? Didn't you get the email? Didn't oh, you, you mean um, you broadcasted? Didn't you oh. get the memo? And, <laughs> Did you not and one get more the thing. We, the TPS um, report. Did you not get the memo about the new TPS report? It, exactly. It, that's exactly it. And that, that is not communication, but many managers, I, I heard of someone, and I hear this all the time, people being fired by email or yeah. fired by text. See, I, one of, some people get... It's amazing. <laughs> one of my favorite, so one so of my favorite much, things but... about our episodes is that, you know, occasionally Greg shows up unstrapped. And when he's <laughs> unstrapped, that actually means <laughs> that he's about to let loose. And since you made a few music references, I just thought just, just for like 10, 15 seconds, I'm going to let Greg jump in here because absolutely, you know, I, I, absolutely. as an interviewer, I've got a time clock this. I'm going to have to handcuff him soon, but, you know, Greg. Oh, oh my gosh. You know, D, so spot on, vulnerability. That's a great word. You're the second person I know in my, in my inner circle that has identified a word uh, for them for the year of, of personal growth and development, which I think is wonderful. But vulnerability is bold. And here's why. Because in a fear-based or a political culture or a less than healthy culture, vulnerability is the most dangerous thing that you could do. I know that because I because <laughs> I survived a very political environment. It's like any vulnerability is used against you in the court of public opinion and politics uh, to, to go against you. And so boldness says, I'm going to be vulnerable. And the reason that's so important for leaders, especially, is it opens the door to those good things that we've been talking about. Slamming that door shut and not being vulnerable, not being uh, willing to be the person asking the questions as opposed to answering them opens that up. So it's spectacular. I love that you're, you're using vulnerability. I won't well, tell you. you know, just so you can be argued with, which is one of our fun moments that we have, I'm going to bring Daniel in. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, Daniel is one of my favorite grommets and uh, as our grumpy old men in IT. And Daniel has probably seen and experienced, yeah, a Done. lot of what we're talking about here, right? I, uh, I came to work Monday morning many, many centuries ago. 
I was the head of IT operations, service management, technical support, enterprise architecture for the second largest bank in the United States. And uh, the only thing I could sign on to is email. I used to have privileges for the privileges that were privileged. How and privileged? My, my team took them away. And as they saw me, how should I say, begin to vocalize my mm, lack of vulnerability and wondering just how long some of them wanted to stay employed, they looked at me and they, I guess they had chosen someone, poor fool, to say, you have a choice. You can either be our manager and our leader or you can be an engineer. And going back to Dee's statement about, you know, who are you really and, and when are you? I started going, okay, I've, I've taken my persona of there before the grace of God walks Daniel Breston a little bit too far and I need to to change and you know, reading books like from David Marquette recently about, I say, I'm a leader, I say collaboration, you as an employee, you hear coercion. What, you know, can your language, I think it was Greg saying, or no, actually it was NJ say, you know, can I make my words match my, what I really do? And, and how I really behave and who I really am, because otherwise, you know, what comes out of the mouth and the ear hears, it's a whole body listening and bending thing, isn't it? It's just not vocal. Yeah. It's, it's everything. And, you know, it can be a pretty scary place when you've got your leader um, having, <laughs> my favorite word, conniption having a little conniption, I guess, uh, when it comes to the uh, bending an ear or trying to do some mind bending, um, which touches on a couple of other topics that we've had later too, uh, earlier that we had in the conversation. Um, Kathy, you know, you and your guys and the teams that you've managed, so many of them are at that front facing. And I'm not talking about just the customer's perspective here. I'm talking about front facing their leaders that come down to the service desk. And that what Daniel's just been talking about, you see the expression on the person's face. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced it a lot myself as well, both in sales and marketing and HR and so on. The standover bending an ear and mind bending versus the nurturing side that we've talked about also, also earlier. What Give us your perspective on this conversation so far. Yeah. Um, well, first I want to say, you know, I was a field engineer, I was a support engineer, I was a lot of things engineering. And as I grew up, you know, higher and higher in the organization, I was blessed not to forget where I came from. That's huge. And carrying that through with me, and the things that I didn't like about bosses that I had, things that I did like about bosses that I had, I carried with me. And then I realized um, that I had other benefits and in, in skills to bring to the team, which is I developed into a very authentic, vulnerable person, um, starters with my team, and then as I got more comfortable and confident outside of my team. But I think being your true self, being authentic, um, vulnerable, and after you've built that trust, People know they can come to you or in a meeting, they can challenge you, quote unquote, you know, professionally and great conversations ensue. Um, great moments of teaching ensue. And I've even had some, as Brene Brown calls it, rumbles where you're, you are listening with as much intensity and passion and respect as you want to be heard. And when I think about that too, as a leader, part of listening is not just with my ears, it's with my eyes, it's with my sensory of, is there tension in the room? 
looking how the other person, you know, what is their body language with? It's not just the spoken words. And so developing all of those skills and setting the proper environment, I think all of those things really accelerate progress, whether it be a situation, and I'm sorry, my dogs are arguing underneath the desk, um, situation. No, they're just communicating. Now they're having a small rumble. They're, yeah. They are rumbling. That is good, Greg. They're rumbling fiercely. I should turn the camera on them. They're having great open dialogue. Being but authentic. you know, They're being true to themselves. Oh, they absolutely are. They don't know how to be any other way. And we shouldn't either. Um, and so I think those things, and you know, you said sometimes it takes bravery. I think it's something that we, we learn to become comfortable with. Our people need that whether it's understanding the situation or whether it's coaching them through understanding interaction with the customer. Yeah. Um, and all those things are about the development of the employee. And someone said earlier, us being our best selves, we can be helping them be the best selves they can be so that they have that confidence and all the skills they need to provide great service. Do you know, sometimes it makes me wonder, we can actually be braver when we're talking to a customer than we can with our own managers and leaders at times. Mm -hmm. It's really strange, isn't it? We can, like, with the yeah. customer, it's like, yes, and, and, and we have this great, you well, know, Well, they think we're smart, and so yeah. they respect us. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a good feeling, isn't it? I mean, I love what you said about, you know, we do. We, we listen with our whole selves. And when I talk about how we shut down the, where the brain processes the sound, it's part of that because the way someone is positioned, e even with the virtual, even on video, are we looking at not the screen, are we looking actually at the cameras if we're looking at you as opposed to the screen? Or, you know, these, these are the little things that have changed in our digital world now as well. Um, Roy, what if you're the one that's having difficulty uh, understanding why the other person keeps saying the same thing over and over? What's missing? What's not happening? I, I think... Nothing's happening. I, I, I just, you know, just reverberating. I'm turning into a mirror, and uh, it's it's a very interesting situation, and it, it can be an extremely frustrating experience. I've had it happen in terms of customer service, where I've been talking to somebody in a customer service situation, and I will state my case, and they say X, and I state it a little bit differently, and they say. X and I stated a little differently and they say X and I eventually get to the point where I say I don't think you're listening to what I'm telling you and and that's that's the point now I'm trying to bend your ear I'm trying to get you to the point where you listen to what I'm actually telling you what is it I'm trying to achieve and sometimes we're very not very good at expressing that what that is we don't even realize what we're trying to achieve until we take a step way back and look at it and say, oh, okay, that's what I was trying to get that person to do, or that's the goal I was after, or that's the thing I was trying to get done. Uh, so it, it's a fascinating world out there. And I think the way that you have to get at this, and I'll go back to refer back to something I said a little bit earlier, sometimes you have to come at it sideways and you have to try to ferret out the questions that will get the other person to pay attention, but maybe not directly because they've heard it. I've heard it. I've heard it. I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to listen anymore. Uh, and uh, try to get at it a little bit sideways and get them to talk a little bit about their perspective and how they're looking at the situation. And then you can start to get them open up to, uh, to, to what you're, you're trying to say. But uh, who asked that question? D asked the question, what happens to the messenger of bad news? And I, I I've was seen that a, Rowan Atkinson skit, you know. Well, you know, cousin Rowan is a different kind of guy. But uh, what ha I was actually in a position where uh, I was brought in from outside an organization. And the reason I was brought in from outside was there was going to have to be a lot of bad news delivered. And they said, Nobody here wants to do that. So let's hire that guy <laughs> and, and let him deliver all the bad news. So that was my job was to basically at every level of the organization say, I'm sorry, you can't do that anymore. I'm taking that away from you. And uh, it was, they called me Dr. Kevorkian. 
for a while. <laughs> God. So wow. Yeah, it was, it, it, that was, that was, you know, I was the, the bearer of bad news. And when I showed up in somebody's doorway, they were like, uh oh. <laughs> I, I resemble that remark somewhat. You know, the amount of murders and acquisitions I've been involved with where it was supposed to be, oh, but you have such a wonderful way of, of putting it. And, you know, and you, we've got all these things that'll help them do it. And you're going to be able to do that. And it's like, oh my God, do I have to be that? person i mean you know we have phrases in our various languages for reasons and one of them is don't please don't kill the messenger yeah <laughs> that is one of the things that we, you know at, and speaking of which speaking of really cool messengers but one that you know man this is one that you never want to put out of whack because the way i talk about my p's and q's that's my patty questions <laughs> <laughs> there is there is a struggle that happens that she's so able to cut through that struggle and that's something that I really learn and admire when it comes to what Patty has to say so Patty why is it that people do struggle to open their minds to other people's ideas what what is it about that and what can we do well the main the main point is we suck at personal criticality we do not evaluate ourselves well we do not we cannot observe our behaviors from the outside our behaviors and who we are are based on our experience and all of the things we bring to the table and our own agendas and our aspirations and all of that so we actually are the worst people for being able to uh, critically evaluate who we are vulnerability and d this was beautiful that you brought it up one of the most difficult things we have in an organization is trying to navigate our way through with all these other people who are also very poor at being self-critical <laughs> and it is easy for us to see someone else's behaviors judge them be critical about them but when you become vulnerable Navigating requires an ecosystem of trust. And one of the things we fail to do is we stay within our bubble. We stay within our own little group. And then when something happens from outside or above, we have not built those trust relationships that require uh, or, or that lend itself to common trust. And when there is common trust across the ecosystem, then we have a little bit more power to be able to move forward. You know, Daniel, I love what you said about, um, and thank you for sharing that. That's very vulnerable of you, so to speak. Um, when you talked about, you were talking about collaboration and what they heard was coercion. And that's something that's, that we've mentioned many times in past episodes. It is not about what you say. It's about what they hear. And, and, we cannot shape a way of helping people hear our intent when it's good intent until we are open and vulnerable to allow ourselves to get to know them on a personal basis, just like Kathy described. We don't spend enough time, I don't think, in organizations looking at the diversity of thought, the diversity of uh, culture, the diversity of accessibility, the diversity of all the things that, that exist there through experiencing, normalizing, exposure to new ways, inventing together, asking enough questions. So really, we struggle because we've, we are so busy bringing our outcomes person to the table that we forget to invite the curiosity part of who we are right so to bend an ear in order to get someone to understand us we first have to shut up and understand them i love your patty homework yeah the, patty, the, homework? <laughs> it's patty homework patty homework i mean guys there's in every absolute every apps episode there will always be patty homework and this is what makes a brilliant exec coach 
because you know what? You can be told stuff. We can bend your ear. You can listen to whatever. But if you're not going to engage and take action on it, then it's just not going to happen because that's like silver spoon stuff. You've got to go out and get gritty, get dirty, get down. Right. And so, do it. so the homework this week then would be yes. be curious. Exactly. Right? If you don't understand something this week, do yourself a favor and immerse yourself in it instead of shut yourself off from it. Come into it. Pretend you're an alien coming to this planet to observe in a way that you are supposed to honestly take learnings away. And the only way you can observe is if you shut up and listen. <laughs> well, so speaking of uh, what we need to do right now, Greg, you've got 20 seconds. Go. What's our Wait. actions for takeaway? All right, then shut up and listen. All right. Just like Patty said, here's my thing. As leaders, you got to the top because you were successful. And that contributes to one of the biggest fallacies that leaders succumb to. And that is my success proves that I'm smart and I'm right. And you've got to kill that thing off and be curious and ask yourself, is my truth really true? Brilliant. Thank you for that. My little takeaway is uh, the curiosity has always been my big thing. It's been what I've been taught growing up is always to ask plenty of questions and be annoyingly so the why. Every time some, somebody says blah, it's like why. And I used to get that, go ask your father. No, go ask your mother. You know, <laughs> don't put up with that until you actually get down to the core of why is this even matter? Um, that's where you need to be when you want to move forward with something and what's important in terms of what shifts your mind and your perspective. But being open, that is so critical. If uh, you don't go out and have the experiences, like, you know, hey, I'm an Aussie living in France. I left home at 18 and joined the army and said, right, that's it. I'm off into the world. And that was probably the most profound moment when I left home and actually did that because it meant I was then exposed. And that's what leaders need to be. Don't get caught in your rut. Don't get caught in your tiny little bubble. You've got to expand those bubbles like we talked about last week. You've got to make sure that your, you know, your relationship nexus is constantly creating new connections so that you can be exposed to new ideas and thoughts and process those, be honest with yourself on what it is. I'm now going to pass this back to Roy because, Roy, what are your courses of action that you want people to go away with today? I think it is super important for people to listen better. Active listening is something that gets taught a lot to frontline people, right? We're used to putting them through the training where they learn how to actively listen to the customer and listen to what the customer is saying. But at some point, Maybe that message gets lost as people move up the chain and they stop actively. Yeah, 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 yeah whatever. We're doing it this way. Um, and it is really, really important for us to pay attention and to try to ferret out the kernel of what's going on. I remember I discussed earlier how sometimes you don't, underst you don't understand what they're really trying to do or what they're really trying to explain. That's, that's the important part. And that's how we bend our mind to understand what the other person is trying to, to communicate with us. So peeps, we made it to the top of the hour. We did. We you know that this could have gone on for a long time. It, it was a great it, topic. This could have it's, been a two episode or. It might well, still let's be. stay and just keep talking. I'm just it, it, should, <laughs> it should go on for a long time, right? Because yes. it is a process, not an event. Right. Oh, there's a takeaway for today. And we wow. have, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Communication is a process, not an event. Yeah. And we only have control over ourselves, no one else. Bingo. Oh, exactly. well said. Okay. Go that human well communication process. Get it in. Yeah. Well, here Dynamic. we are. Dynamic. We're going to go back into uh, 
gallery view here so we can see everyone on the, on the YouTube screen. And here we go again, it's KTLO keeping the learning on. We're just pointing in all different directions, but that's okay. It means there's diversity in this crew. Awesome. All right.